Hello and welcome everybody to another very entertaining video. My goal today is to introduce the concept of digestion and to walk through some of the developmental aspects of the digestive system and then take a closer look at the stomach as an example of some of the things that we'll be talking about. Later videos will specifically detail how the body digests and absorbs carbohydrates, proteins, lipids. All of these will focus on certain aspects of the small intestine. Today, with an introduction, we just kind of want to take a broad view of how all of this developed and then look at the role of the stomach in establishing a paradigm for the communicative events that take place in order to digest foodstuffs. All right, to help understand how the digestive system was developed, I want to go back in time to a point during embryonic development called gastrulation. And while the specifics are complex, we're going to try and break it down into, into something that's fairly simple to understand. For humans, all of this is happening about three weeks after fertilization, and the role of gastrulation is to provide what are called three germ layers. These germ layers are layers that all tissues in the body derive from. And you can think of it essentially as a short stack of pancakes, three pancakes, one on top of the other. The topmost layer called the ectoderm, and this will give rise to two different tissue types, the epidermis, which is your outer skin, of course, and your neuronal tissue including the brain, spinal cord, among other things. The second layer, again, these are just flat layers of cells, is the mesoderm. And broadly speaking, we can think of this as muscle and bone. And then the last layer is endoderm. And this gives rise to your gut tube. Now, to kind of see how all this stuff is going to happen, what I'd like to do next is show you what's called a tube within a tube body plan. Let's again start with three flat layers. Ectoderm on top, mesoderm in the middle, endoderm on the bottom. The way the body plan unfolds is simply a bend downward based on variable growth in certain regions. The ectoderm has this little pouch on the top, the beginnings of the neural tube, what will become the brain and spinal cord. And we have our endoderm, or our mesoderm, and our endoderm. Now, these will eventually come around and fuse with their perspective layers. Here's the ectoderm, and we see that pouch that was folded on top. This actually dropped off. That's my neural tube, and that's going to become brain and spinal cord. The mesoderm comes around and fuses with itself. And this is what's interesting, and this is the focus of why I'm trying to do this. The endoderm also fuses with itself. And this represents a tube. So this is why we call it a tube within a tube body plan. This area, shaded in green, is the gut tube. And it's a hollow tube running the length of the embryo. While it's not a perfect cylinder, we can kind of take a different view of this, where we've created this tube, of course the neural tube here, running the length of the embryo, and the gut tube beneath it, this hollow tube running the length of the embryo. As this gut tube begins to, di to differentiate, we get a structure that's divided up into four pouches. These will become prospectively the mouth, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. And smooth muscle doors, or sphincters, are built to regulate the passage from one chamber to the next. So here, for example, we have the upper and lower esophageal sphincters, the transition from the stomach to the small intestine, the pyloric sphincter, the ileocecal sphincter, regulating movement from the small intestine to the large intestine, and then another set of paired sphincters, the internal and external anal sphincters. And hopefully this review of embryonic development gives you kind of a sense of how this whole system is put together. And perhaps most important for our discussion, why we see similarities with the mouth and the stomach and the small intestine, their layers, their composition, how they're built, how they communicate with each other. All of these things are critical for understanding the function of digestion. So what we want to do next, let's pick a region along this, this gut tube and let's examine it a little bit more closely. So let's look, for example, here. If we were to zoom in on that, let's take the gut tube and cross section. We're zooming in on this structure here. The innermost layer of cells is called the mucosa. The cell type is called an enterocyte, and it can be roughly divided up into two different classes, absorptive and endocrine. Absorptive, of course, is all about where digestion takes place, and endocrine is all about hormones that regulate digestion. All right, moving outward, what are we going to find? We're going to find connective tissue. This is what we call the submucosa. 
Within this connective tissue, we're going to find aspects of the enteric nervous system called the submucosal plexus. And this part of the enteric, ner ner the enteric nervous system is all about regulating glandular secretions. Now, as we continue to zoom out, we're going to run into smooth muscle. Now, this will look a little bit different depending on where I am in the stomach versus the small intestine versus the large intestine. But in the small intestine where we were, it might look something like this, where we can see it's actually consisted of two layers, an inner layer that's circular and an outer layer that's longitudinal. And sandwiched in between these two, we find a complex of neurons called the myenteric nerve plexus. This is the other half of the enteric nervous system. And because this is playing around with muscle, while the other one in the submucosal plexus was regulating secretions, this one is all about peristaltic contraction, where peristalsis is the sequential movement that squeezes a tube from one point to another to initiate movement of the substance within that tube, to squeeze it unidirectionally. And then the last layer that we want to talk about, if we were to sum all of these up, starting again with the gut tube in the middle, the mucosal layer next, the submucosal connective tissue, and the submucosal plexus, followed by a layer of smooth muscle, and finally what we call the serosa, which is simply my outer connective tissue, and it serves the general role of lubrication so that these things are free to move within the body to a limited extent, of course. But now, hopefully, we have a general sense of how the gut tube is built, what layers we would expect to find, and what we want to do now is we want to kind of focus on the cells themselves that make all of the magic happen. So let's come back up to the scum. The so let's come back up to the stomach, and once again, let's zoom in. So zooming in onto the stomach, we see that the inner surface of the stomach is lined with pits, what we call gastric pits. If we follow the pit down, we would go through this neck portion of the pit that's called the isthmus, and from there, we would enter into the gastric gland. And this is where we want to take the story. We want to look at the cells inside the gastric gland to help understand, at least initially, how all of this stuff is regulated in the process of beginning to digest food. So let's take a closer look at the gastric gland. As we now zoom in, let's blow this structure up and see if we can identify the types of cells we might find. Working top to bottom, the first thing we're going to see is the mucus cell. And this is a very important cell. Because of its secretion of mucus, this provides a protection against the low pH of the stomach. The next cell we'll find interspersed as we continue to work down into the depths of this pit is the chief cell. The chief cell's primary function is simply to secrete an enzyme or a proenzyme called pepsinogen. Another cell we'll find is the parietal cell, and it's got two important jobs. The first one is the secretion of acid, and the second is the secretion of a substance called intrinsic factor, and intrinsic factor is important for vitamin B12 absorption. And then down here in the bottom, this is where we find our neuroendocrine cells, and we'll detail all of these shortly, but just to give a list, we've got the G cell, the D or delta cell, what's called an ECL, which stands for enterochromaffin-like, and another one, the PD-1 cell, these are all involved in regulating the function of the cells around them. Specifically, the G cell releases gastrin, and this is the on switch for the system that we'll detail here in a minute. The D cell is all about somatostatin, which is the off switch. ECL cell releases histamine, which is a driver of stomach acid independent of food. And from the PD-1 cells, we see the release of ghrelin which is a hunger hormone. It increases feeding, it increases weight gain, and is triggered when the stomach is empty. So we can kind of take a broad step back now and see how all of this stuff is working together. Where the entire gut tube is made during embryonic development from the endoderm as it rounds up in circles on itself, making this hollow gut. And within that gut and within the layers, we find essentially two different types of cells. Cells involved directly in the digestive and absorptive processes, and then the endocrine cells, what we call neuroendocrine cells, that help regulate and maintain homeostasis and function within the gut tube.